In this video, we are going to learn how to use our Rook and King in the endgame, and our guide will be the third world champion, Jose Raul Capablanca. Hey guys, Brian Castro here with Better Chess Training, and today we're going to look at a uh, game between Capablanca and Savelli Tartakauer uh, from the famous uh, New York tournament in 1924. Uh, this is a well-known game. Uh, but I wanted to uh, give comments uh, more for beginners today because I think, uh, well, first off, I uh, last few games I've done have been um, attacking games, and I wanted to kind of show uh, that not all games are won with a brilliant attack and sacrifice and that sometimes we need to win in the endgame. And Capablanca was probably uh, one of the best endgame players ever, and this was a very nice game to show a few important principles. So we're going to uh, go through this game. I'm going to focus mainly on the end game, but I'll make a few comments in between as we go along. So let's get started here. And Capablanco had the white pieces. He started off with d4. And uh, Tartakauer replied with e6. Now this can go a few different directions um, before we go back to the game. If white were to play e4, then... Uh, black can play uh, d5, which would be the French defense. But uh, Kefelblanca played knight to f3, and Tartikauer played f5, and this is the Dutch. Now, a couple other ways we can go here. Traditionally, we might see something like either d5 or knight to f6, which could also head into a lot of uh, different directions. A lot of times with these d4 openings, there's a lot of transpositions and move order uh, tricks, whereas with e4, there are, are, are those as well, but it's a sometimes it's a little more um, defined, and we can get more into that at some other point, but uh, the idea here is that there's a lot of options, and this move here, knight to f3, um, gives us some flexibility, but after Tartikauer plays the Dutch, uh, we have some ideas here. Now, the idea here is that this f5 pawn restricts e4, and as we talked about in our opening principles, we want to can try to control the center, and ideally, uh, white or either player would want to, would love to have two pawns uh, next to each other here controlling these central squares. So f5 is one way to stop it. Obviously, we, we talked about uh, d5 and knight to f6 also being a way. So you, you're, hopefully you'll notice as you study chess and study these games that that's the general idea behind these opening moves. So f5 is the Dutch uh, and it has a lot of uh, features to it. One of the things that black has to watch out for is this weak diagonal here and I think I showed this in a um, another video, actually in a video I made last week on uh, For the Beginners or a couple weeks ago. Okay, c4 and again this is controlling d5 Knight to f6, fairly standard. Again, putting more uh, pressure or putting more of a guard here on e4. Bishop to g5. Okay, now pinning this knight. There's no immediate threats here, but uh, black want, or white wants to uh, get this bishop out. And as we'll see, this is a, a typical type of maneuver we have here um, with white. Bishop to e7. Okay, so now the knight can move. And knight to c3. So you can see here in the opening, black uh, kind of has con has control of the e4 square, or they're contesting control, and same thing here, because of white's pawn here, white uh, is contesting the d5 square. Okay, black castles. And uh, another option here, black can play knight to e4 right away, and uh, this actually has been seen in some master games. Uh, and Play could go like this. Bishop takes e7, queen takes e7, queen to c2 to try to uh, win a pawn here. And knight takes c3, queen takes c3, d6, which supports a uh, e5 push, and e3. So this is um, a game that's, this is from a game that was played in 2011, but this would be kind of a standard option here as well, but uh, this is not from the game, so we won't go too far into that. Let's go back to the game position. Black castles, and 
white plays e3, so now this, this bishop can, can get activated. Okay, b6. So we notice here in the Dutch, um, oftentimes, because of these pawns here on the light squares, the, the bishop will develop either to a6 or to b7. Okay, bishop to d3. Now you can see here, this, they're really fighting for this e4 square. Bishop to b7. Castles. Okay. Queen to e8. So the idea here is that this queen can um, sometimes come out here to h5, and this knight would plant itself here on e4 at, with a kingside attack. So that is kind of one of the common, um, common themes in the Dutch. Queen to e2. So the idea here is that white, to combat black's plans, wants to push uh, e4 at some point. And that would allow the queen and maybe the rook to come in here to help contest this square as well. Okay, well, here black decides to plunk his knight onto e4 to stop this push, but also to free his game a little bit. So white has a little more space here. So space we can think of as uh, the, the amount of space is determined by where the pawns are placed. And so oftentimes white, because white gets to move first, will have uh, a slight space, space advantage. And one way uh, that black frees itself sometimes is by exchanging pieces. So uh, that's what he does here, as well as posting this knight in a strong spot. Um, so bishop takes e7. And black uh, makes a, a very important choice here. He plays uh, knight takes c3, and you can see here it's attacking this queen, so white has to deal with this before doing anything with his bishop. And b takes c3, and then queen takes e7. Now, what we'll notice here, these are called doubled pawns, and I think we've talked about them before, uh, but Sometimes, especially if this D pawn were to disappear or weren't, wouldn't be here, these would become weak because uh, pawns can't protect it here um, and often can, can be something that can be attacked by black. But in this case, it also gives white uh, some compensation because he has his half-open uh, B file. And so we'll see here with white's next move, which is A4, a couple ideas here. One, he could push to a5 and try to mess around with black's um, pawn structure. But the other thing is, because of these doubled pawns, what black would love to do would be to bring his queen over to a3 to attack it. So a4 prevents that because now the rook is covering a3. Okay, bishop takes f3. Uh, quickly, another read. Even though this bishop is looking down this uh, long diagonal, uh, this knight can get to e5 and cause some trouble as well. Uh, it's, it's a very good piece, so black exchanges that off. Queen takes f3, and knight takes, or knight to c6. Okay, white now plays rook f to b1. And so uh, at some point, white can advance one of these pawns, and if this pawn, the b pawn, were to take, then this rook can get to the seventh rank here and attack these pawns. And we'll talk about this later. Uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned this in other videos, but rooks on the seventh rank are often very powerful because of all these pawns they can gobble up, and also in some cases it can restrict the king. And we're going to see that a little later in this game. Okay, uh, rook a to e8. So what black wants to do is, again, he wants to free his own game here. You can see White's got uh, some space in the queen side. Black has a little bit on the king side, but what he'd love to do here is play uh, for e5. And if for some reason white were to take on e5, this knight now becomes much more effective. Okay? And to combat this, Kepa Black will plays queen to h3. So how does this uh, prevent e5? Well, quite simply, if e5 were to be played right now, then white can win this pawn. Now, let's say that white did something different. And I'm just going to make a move here just so we can see an example. Let's just move this king. If white were to play this now, uh, and or black were to play e5 now, and white were to take here, 
well, now this bishop is pinned and something like this, and uh, we're in a little bit of trouble, okay? So again, this wouldn't be played uh, by either of these players, but I just wanted to give you an example of why uh, queen to h3 was played. So let's go back to that. So kind of a uh, uh, preventative move or prophylactic move, as we say in chess. Okay, rook to f6. Okay, the rook lift is mainly to come over here at some point and put some pressure on the king side. Okay, f4. This is a very good move by Capablanca, and what he's doing here basically is making this move very hard. Now, what what White wants to do, he wants to play e4, and again, that would make his own pieces, his own bishop, much more effective. Um, and f4 just prevents Black from playing his own uh, pawn lever or pawn break. Okay, knight to a5. Okay, trying to put a little pressure on this pawn, and maybe. Uh, trying to reposition for uh, various maneuvers, maybe we like to knight to b7, back to c5 after this pawn break. Uh, anyways, it's a very uh, flexible move, not a bad one. Uh, queen to f3, and here we can see now the queen's eyeing this whole uh, diagonal here. d6, and again, black is preparing to play this e5 move. Okay, rook to e1. Okay, with this knight here blocking the a pawn uh, and d6 being played, um, probably white's not going to be playing one of these pawn breaks anytime soon. So now he prepares for what he wants to play, which is uh, e4 by putting this rook behind the e pawn. Queen to d7. Okay, white moves forward with his planned uh, pawn lever, and let's see what happens. F takes e4. Queen takes e4, threatening this check here. g6, and g3, supporting uh, the f4 pawn. Okay, So now we see that white can put pressure on this uh, pawn here, and so uh, that is a positional edge that he has there. Okay, king to f8. So black is preparing um, to protect this pawn as well as protect these pieces along this file here. Uh, king to g2. And so the idea here with these king moves is that there's nothing uh, immediate happening that either player has to, to deal with uh, in terms of tactics and an attack like we've seen in some of our other games. So... Uh, as these pieces get exchanged, we're going to be entering the end game. And in the end game, we're, you know, so in the opening in the middle game, we want the king to uh, be safe and, you know, usually tucks himself away here uh, on the king's side. But as we, as the pieces come off and there's less danger of an immediate checkmate or a threat against the king, uh, he wants to start moving towards the center of the board or towards the action. And so both players take a couple moves to do that. Okay. Rook to... Uh, F7, and you know maybe thinking of putting it here on E7 to double up. Okay, H4. So we'll see here. This is the next phase of Kappa's plan, or his 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 uh, general idea here is that uh, well, he does want to restrict these pawns here, but he's already looking towards the end game, and in the end game, he wants to push this pawn and open this file for his rooks. Um, so he's starting to starting that plan here. Okay, d5, and here, of course, we're uh, forking this pawn and queen. White takes, and e takes d5. And so when black went into this sequence, he basically expected um, what's going to happen next, which is the exchanging into an endgame. But let's just go back real quick, um, just so you know here. If the queen takes... Uh, then a couple things can happen, but we can transpose back into what happens in the game here. Okay, um, well, let's go back. The idea here, though, e takes d5 just on a positional point. We are going to exchange these pieces, but now this pawn, uh, the c pawn, cannot advance, uh, you know, if these pieces were without support from a piece because uh, this pawn is here. So this is actually called a backward pawn. Uh, and I actually have a video on backward pawns that uh, I'll put in the description 
case you want to know more about that. Okay, so white decides to exchange into an endgame. Queen takes e8 check. Queen takes e8. Rook takes e8 check. And king takes e8. So, okay, if we take a moment to assess this position, uh, let's we can take a look at a few things. So white has what we call pawn majority on the king side. And uh, that basically means he has more pawns uh, than than black does on the king side, whereas black has the uh, majority on the queen side. So the general plan, and this is for pretty much all pawn and games with pawns, is you want to advance your majority and eventually create what is called a pass pawn. We'll see what that is in a few minutes when it gets uh, created here. Uh, also, we have a few things here. We have an open D file. And so players might want to fight for that to get access. Uh, we also have um, a couple pawn features here. We see here that white's pawns on the queen side are are split up here, and then he has this backward pawn that we mentioned earlier. So, uh, okay, let's keep moving on with the game. Now, here is what we mentioned before, part of Kevelblanco's plan. Uh, instead of fighting for this D file, like I mentioned, uh, white is going to play h5. And here's the idea. Basically, if black were to take it, then white would play right here. Okay, and you can see here, because this bishop, is, now you see this bishop here is attacking the h7 pawn, but also it's covering this f5 square. So there's no way for uh, black to protect this pawn, and now this rook will be uh, aiming down the file as well. So uh, that's the idea there. And instead, uh, black decides to protect the pawn at this point here. And that's fine for Capablanca. He's going to take it. And then black takes back. And now, uh, rook to h1. And you can see here, this, this h file is all white. Okay, king to f8, trying to get back over here to stop things. And here is the key move of the position. And that's rook to h7. And we'll see here that this makes it uh, decisively uh, a white advantage. Because now uh, we're attacking these pawns. And also, this king can never leave this back rank unless white lets him. Well, black counterattacks here with uh, rook to um, c6. And he uh, obviously is going to take this pawn. And there's no way white can protect it. Uh, Kevelblanca had planned this ahead of time, uh, or or knew that this was going to be the case. And the idea here is that um, he's looking, not that he cal the idea he's not calculating this all out necessarily, but he knows that uh, if he can create a pass pawn here and promote it, that these pawns won't matter and he'll win the game. So he's able to do that by sacrificing this. He gains time. Okay, so you're giving up. So chess is always about a give and take. Okay, and and I've I've uh, talked about this before. And here he's going to give up a pawn in order to gain time. Okay, so he plays g4, and knight to c4, and it would not be a good idea to take this here, um, because now this rook is bearing down on these pawns, and he's going to lose uh, too many pawns. Okay, so let's go back. Plays g5. Black plays knight to e3 check. King to f3. And knight to f5. Again, if this uh, knight now looks fairly well placed to defend here, but the problem is that now is a great time for white to uh, take take this knight to capture it. And the reason why is because after b takes f5, g takes f5, now he creates a passed pawn. So a passed pawn is one that is not, uh, can no longer be uh, stopped by an opposing pawn. So uh, black would have to use um, his pieces, in this case his king and his rook, to stop it. One thing uh, to note here is that I think what Kepelblanca was or what uh, Tartakauer was hoping for was that um, Kepelblanca would do something in terms of, he would be worried about black taking this pawn with check. But again, 
um, he doesn't necessarily need to worry because he uh, had figured out or had, had looked into this. So this party might have done some calculations in terms of trying to figure out um, the correct sequence here. So anyways, bishop takes f5, g takes f5, and then king to g3, okay? And you'll see here uh, Kepelblanca's brilliant idea. He's going to give up this pawn, but he's going to just move his king into an ideal position to support his own passed pawn uh, moving up. So let's see what happens here. Rook takes c3 check, and now we see why he had to move the king to g3 because he wants to go here to h4 because uh, if he had left it here, his king would have been forced back. Okay, rook to f3, and again, uh, Capablanca giving up another pawn, but that's okay. g6, Rook takes f4 check, king to g5, okay, attacking this rook, of course, rook to e4. Now, it would be a mistake to take this pawn, a little too greedy here, because now this king would get in, and it takes too long for this rook to uh, to get back. In fact, uh, well, in fact, if you were to do that, this would be a checkmate, okay? So he goes to e4 with the intention of bringing this rook back to defend, okay? King to f6, and I just want to make it uh, understood here. Um, king takes f5, again, would not be a total mistake, but kind of against what Capablanca is doing, because his idea here is to promote this pawn, and what we'll see in the game is that uh, if he can't promote it, to use it to distract black in order to um, to exchange these pawns or to, to take these pawns. In any case, um, he plays king to f6 because now black, one of black's resources, he, well, first off, he is, he's threatening checkmate, but also one of um, black's resources would be to check the white king and w his own pawn is blocking him here. Okay, so excellent move by Capablanca. King to g8. Okay, rook to g7 check. And what this does is it uh, forces the king to h8. Okay, after rook to g7 check, uh, the black king goes to h8. And it could have gone to f8 with a very similar type of position uh, after this. Rook takes c7, rook to e8 to protect against mate, and then king to f5. And you can see here that black's very passive. White is going to win this pawn, probably win this pawn as well, and, and it's a totally winning position. But instead he went to h8, so let's go back there. And here rook takes c7, again now threatening checkmate on the back rank. So rook to e8, and king takes f5. And very simple here. Now, at this point, when we look at the endgame, remember, even though we created this past pawn, the end goal would, would have been great to promote this, but now white will just use this because um, to uh, keep black busy and go after these pawns. Okay, so that's the plan from here on. Rook to e4 king to f6, and now, well, actually, we are, because of this, we're, we're threatening mate again, and we're threatening to uh, push this pawn as well, uh, and black plays rook to f4 check, and here was the idea, now king to e5, and now this white king's going to grab these pawns, rook to g4, g7 check, okay, after g7 check, it would be a mistake to take um, on g7, because after rook takes g7, king takes g7, uh, this is uh, absolutely uh, uh, one for white. And let me show you an example here. King takes d5, okay, king to f7, and now king to d6, okay, and after king to e8, king to c7, and now this pawn will just start rolling up the board here. King to e7, d5, and there's nothing that black can do to stop this pawn, okay, and that would be that. So going back, uh, black played king to g8, 
and then white grabs a pawn. Rook to g1. King takes d5. Rook to c1. Okay, so he's trying to keep this king out here. King to d6. Rook to c2. d5. Rook to c1. Okay, so just so you understand this, uh, the rook is just trying to stay on this c file, and he doesn't. He can't really move the king anywhere. He doesn't want to move the king, and so um, he's just trying to keep this white king away from the queen side. Rook to c7, and so now uh, white's going to force him away. Okay, rook to a1, king to c6. Okay, he doesn't care about this pawn because again, he's got two pawns that he can, you know, he he just needs to promote one of them to win. Rook takes a4, d6, and at this point, uh, Black realized that it was over, and he resigned. Okay, well, before we finish up, let's review a few of the key points in this game. And the first one I want to uh, mention is this opening, learning how to open a file using our pawns. Um, remember, our rooks need uh, half-open files and open files in order to operate effectively, and so here, again, planned ahead, uh, white plays h5 and then opens up the h file. And after h takes g6, takes this h file, okay? Um, okay, the second key concept here is uh, taking the seventh rank uh, with your rooks, with rook to h7. Uh, this isn't just an end game principle. Actually, if it happens, uh, if you can do it in the middle game, it can often be very effective and can end the game end the game early. Okay, so this is the second thing uh, to remember from this game. And finally, I want to you to remember to always bring your king, uh, make your king as active as possible in these uh, rook and uh, actually any end game, but especially uh, these rook and pawn end games. And uh, just to review this sequence, after he plays g6. Uh, in order to give his king this uh, g5 square to get to, and after rook to f takes f4, check, plays king to g5, and after rook to e4, uh, plays king to f6, and here we can see just how dominant white's king is over black's, and if you remember to do that in your end games, uh, you're going to be winning a lot of end games. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please press the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Also, if there's any, uh, any of the moves or any of the concepts that you would like a little more explanation on or didn't quite, um, that I didn't explain clearly enough, please let me know in the comments and I'll be sure to uh, respond to those. And otherwise, good luck with your chess and looking forward to seeing you soon.